Well, guys and gals, for the longest time, uh, God has placed it on my heart that we would, uh, that we would take some targeted time uh, in our time together here on Wednesday nights to really address a, a topic uh, from, from the perspective of God's Word that is something that is very present, very prevalent in your life. And so, so for the span of the last month, uh, we've, we've looked at, at what does the Bible have to say about anxiety and depression? Uh, what are some things that are real about it? What are some things that are myths about it? And we've approached that totally from a biblical perspective of just looking at what is it that God's Word says. Well, tonight, uh, we've got some special guests who God has called into this area of ministry, that God's called them in the, into this uh, experientially, educationally, vocationally, and it's by their passion. These are people who uh, know Jesus, love Jesus, and follow Jesus, and God has called them into the ministry of Christian counseling. So if you would, would you please give a refuge Bible study welcome to Debbie Utterback and Travis Moore. <laughs> Debbie and Travis have taken time out of their evening. As a matter of fact, they were serving, uh, they were serving people today and racing across town to get here in, t- in time to, to share with us here tonight. Uh, so we've asked them just to come here. They, now, over the span of the last several weeks, there's been questions that you have submitted uh, either in person or online. And the, a lot of those questions we've kind of compressed together uh, to kind of make same ideas, same ideas. They're going to be addressing those in just a moment. But at, I, I would ask them at first just to kind of explain a little bit about who you are, the ministry that God's called you to. Make sure that microphone is turned on. Bink. Just like that. <laughs> yeah, because you're doing what we ask you to do, okay? Hey, make sure and turn that off. Uh, so, uh, Debbie, if you would, just start out, just tell us a little bit about uh, your ministry, what God's called you to do, and your thoughts on our topic that we're talking about here tonight. Um, so, I uh, my training is in social work, and there's a lot of different branches of how to become a professional counselor. And so mine is in social work. Um, from when I was in soft, a sophomore year, I knew that God had called me to be a counselor, um, to work with people who um, needed emotional help and to do it with horses. And I did like a science therapy project and like um, that was always my passion. And um, it's funny how we imagine how we're going to get where we're going to get and then how God leads us where we're going to get and why. And um, I just, um, I think that's a lot of what my life has been is looking back and just um, praising God for those um, blessings that he is the one who orchestrates our steps and leads us where we need to go. Right now, I do counseling in an office setting and I do counseling in, um, at a ranch in an in a outdoors with horses setting. And so um, therapy can look different depending on what you, I sometimes I do it in um, telehealth where it's through kind of like a zoom look and stuff and so through the pandemic and different things we have had to adapt what counseling looks like but um, that's kind of what um, what I do um, as far as my thoughts about this I think it's super important that we have um, this lens that we can look through and figure out um, what does God say about me and what I'm walking through. And I think that's um, very important. Hello. Hold up. He should get it on here in just a second. I think he's got you now. Got me now? Maybe not. (laughs) Hello? Okay, there we go. Great. Um, Okay, so I guess we're talking about the path, how we got here, God's calling. I think... um, You know, we were talking in the hall, and it's kind of like what Debbie was saying. There's no way I could have ever written the script that got me into counseling the way I did. It's clearly by by God's hand. Um, My whole life, I've always loved the outdoors and been passionate about fishing and fly fishing. And uh, that's what I did for 15 years. I was in fly fishing world. So I I got to travel all over the place. There's a fly fishing world? Oh, yeah. Like, it exists? (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Get me in that. wonderful place. Um, so that was that was my life, my career, and I started. Um, I taught, so I, I was taking uh, cancer survivors, wounded warriors, on these fly fishing retreats that were designed to help them um, kind of work through some of the traumas they'd experience. Um, and at that point, it just it all clicked, it all connected. I saw the connection um, between the outdoors, my passion, uh, how powerful, you know, God's creation is, and, and when, we, when we really seek it out and use it as a tool uh, for coping and, and, and health. And um, 
So yeah, I, I kind of I pursued how I could integrate the outdoors and counseling, um, and found the horses out at Jakey's, and uh, I still do fishing. I, I did a, a session today where we were we were out on the water fly fishing as well. So did you catch anything today? We we did. We caught some bluegill and a little bass. Man, all right. Yeah. Productive um, day. Yeah, it's really it's really good. So, it, like I said, strange path, um, and there's really only one way to explain how it how it happened. Um, and then, you know, how important I think this issue is, and how special I think it is that you guys are talking about it. Um, it really is amazing to see this showing up in church, and I hope that we're able to show you there's a lot of different ways that counseling and mental health um, can can be addressed. Amen. Man, yeah, and, you know, we've talked about that in recent weeks, Travis, just about the fact that there have, I mean, just admittedly, there's been times throughout the history of the church where there's certain buzzwords that have been taboo words that you're kind of not, you're supposed to come to church and put on the happy face and act like everything's okay, and so words like depression and anxiety and worry and fear and counseling and therapy, that those are things that we kind of don't talk about in church, but we've, <laughs> we've created a safe space here where we say, hey, those words are not going to be taboo anymore. Those are things that are a reality in your life. So those are realities that God wants to deal with in your life. Uh, now, guys and gals, uh, like I said, over the span of the last month, you guys have, uh, have submitted some questions. A lot of those questions had some similar themes. So you might hear your question just directly quoted here tonight, or you might hear it um, melded into another question. But some of those questions kind of got common themes. And so um, if you guys don't mind, I want to just go ahead and start out with some of, some of the questions that were submitted here. Let's start out with this. Uh, this goes back to where, when we started out this series, the, the, the series that, we, that we've been doing about what does the Bible say about anxiety and depression, the first thing was we say it's not a sin. And part of what we talked about that night is the fact that God has created you the way that he created you on purpose, and that includes your brain chemistry. And your brain chemistry contributes to your susceptibility to anxiety and depression. So a questioner asked this, Mike said that God made us with the brain chemistry that he intended for us to have. So experiencing anxiety is not a sin. But if the Bible tells us not to be anxious about anything, does that mean that God made us to fail? Or does that mean that since Adam sinned and all of us were born into sin, that experiencing anxiety is not really my fault, but the way that I respond to anxiety and depression, it, and depression can be either holy or sinful? So I think you've got to get the essence of that question. We've been, we've been talking about the fact that it is not a sin, but where does that all, where does that all kind of right. fit it's, in? To it's this? the applicable part. Like, how does, right. what does this mean to me? Exactly. How, how can I take what I've heard and like re reconcile it with what I know about my body and what I know about me? Um, I think the my to address kind of that underlying theme is um, is to tell a little bit about my story. Um, I'm dyslexic, and so growing up, I had messages about from my peers, from just from ranging from being made fun of and called stupid to like people advocating for me and like trying to help and stuff, but regardless the message is I'm different than yeah. you or whatever. And so to, to hear the Bible verses in Psalms where it says you knit me together in my mother's womb and you, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made to then look at my life and my life doesn't reflect that. To me, it feels like I'm, I, I have to struggle. Everything's harder. I feel stupid, you know? And so there was a period of my life that I really, really wrestled with what what does this mean for me? And I think um, it, it took um, a lot of um, really internal strengths to say, I'm going to choose. Um, and that came from prayer. So it didn't come from within me because I felt uh, broken. And so I, um, I, every night before I went to bed, I chose to say, I am grateful that you made me the way that I, I am. Yeah. And um, I am going to believe, I believe that I am fearfully, wonderfully made. And it, over a long, extended period of time, was I able to, to say those words and believe it? And I think that goes to the core truth of, like, if we're, if the, the God will help us believe what is true about us. And now that I'm in my 30s and I look back, I can see how he did create me for a specific calling and with a specific reason to touch a specific 
group of people that are struggling with those same messages. And there are people that I work with now that have struggles with loving themselves because they have believed a message of I am different and that's not okay. Instead of what God has said is I've knit you together, I've called you apart, I've, I have a purpose for you. And so working with that and coming alongside of like knowing that those two things can be true. I can be different and it can be hard, yet God is still good to me and he didn't mess up when he made me. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, Debbie, and that's actually one of the, what you're talking about there, it's one of the things that we talked about last week. The, the message that we did last, last week was called Don't Feed the Lies, and that there, there's plenty of lies out there that will uh, make it worse, that will just play on your anxieties that are already there, that will amplify your depression that might already be there. So don't buy into those lies. Don't feed those lies. They don't need any more nutrition. They have plenty enough to survive on their own. Uh, Travis, do you have any thoughts about, about that, about, you know, God, God created me as he created me on purpose. So did God make a mistake if he made me predisposed to these things? No. I, and and uh, what we were talking about is God also made our brains change over yeah. time as well. Right. So, you know, when you're a toddler, your brain looks totally different than when you're an adult. And, and the teenage brain um, is often misunderstood <laughs> or, or uh, you know, disagreed with. With good and reason. You have, yeah. Can you bring up the slide? So um, I, I really feel it, it's fascinating to me. Um, it's, it's beautiful how the brain evolves. And when it gets to the point where you guys are at, um, it really acts really special. And I think, again, it's more evidence of like God's overarching plan of it not being bad or wrong. Um, go to that next slide. So this is a quote. I don't know if you guys can read it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a book. Um, oh, my gosh. I think it's called Inventing Ourselves. But it talks about how fluid the teenage brain is, right? So sometimes adults say, okay, they're risky. They're, they're, they're too worried about themselves or they're feeling anxious, self-conscious. Um, and often the adolescent brain is stigmatized. But really, um, if you look at it through a different lens, it is ripe for um, education and experience and, and really, um, what we wanted to talk about was how you guys are shaping your brains by, by showing up here, you know, thinking the thoughts that you think, and really being aware of how you're creating um, certain neural pathways and, and stuff like that. I want to fly through these next couple slides. Go right ahead. Okay. I'm just get, uh, what's that next one? All right. Okay. So uh, your mind changes the activity, therefore, the structure of your brain. Your, your brains are, like, exploding right now. And, and they're very fluid. Uh, when you're a toddler and when you're a teenager, you, you shape, like literally shape, the physical structure of your brain more than any other time. So again, it's really special that that, that happens at, at this age. So that's happening through strengthening neural pathways. So if, if you use it, it's going to get stronger and faster and better. So positive thinking versus negative thinking. Um, synaptic pruning is. The stuff that you don't need, you're, you're kind of chopping away. Um, and then also, what's wiring in is the prefrontal cortex, and, and your, your brain is becoming more whole. And that's really kind of the sign of, of maturity. So let me see what the next one is. say something? No, yeah, I was going to talk about, like, if we think about highways, and we think about, like, the country roads, they don't get used as much, but the super highways, and, like, how you can get from Frisco down to you know, downtown Dallas and the different, just all of the things that interconnect together, that's your brain trying to connect thoughts and learn and develop different things. Yeah, and, and the more we reinforce the, the healthy thoughts and thought patterns, the more easily they'll be accessed, I guess. Same thing with negative, um, negative thoughts, patterns. Yeah, and guys, that, that's, that's so similar to what we talked about last week. One of the, one of the passages of Scripture that's been central to what we've been doing, it, it's all from what, uh, from what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, kind of uh, coming to a crescendo at Philippians 4, 8, where he says, uh, Finally, brothers and, sis brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And that's these neuro pathways that God has created right. us for, that God placed in his word, even as a way of telling us, look, you feed these things, 
then that's going to bring you more toward the uh, emotional and mental wellness that I've created you for. You feed these other things, and then you know they're going to devour you as well. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, I want to just briefly hit on this slide too. I don't know. We could spend days talking <laughs> about this, but so not only is is the adolescent brain unique, but it's especially you guys are in a, a very unique time. Um, and so if if you show some of the this generation is different than anyone that's come before it. You've grown up with the internet, smartphones, um, social media, and pressure that, that we never had. Um, along with that is there are a lot of um, higher rates of overall reported loneliness, lack of connection, um, isolation. Uh, this is a good one. Um, less risk and dangerous behavior. So there's a lot less um, like drinking and driving incidents with teenagers you guys are being safer, you're failing less as well, which may or may not be connected with some of the other stuff. You know, risk disappearing from your life may be correlated with um, some of the overall reported happiness, increased anxiety, this fear to fail. Um, and also, I, I know that last one may sting a little bit, less resilience and slower maturity, but yeah. that, that is um, when you don't fail, fall down and get back up, you don't, you don't Broke. learn how to. Um, so mm -hmm. it, it's something that, um, something to think about how you can, I'm not advocating for risk or dangerous behavior, <laughs> but experience is something that is disappearing from Sometimes you got to scrape your knee, right? Right, yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of a, a way to look at it. Um, experience life outside of your phone or social media. You know, guys, I want to take something out of order from what I prepared you for, because sure, sure. I think, uh, Travis, I think you just began to speak to it. We, um, you know, one of the questions that we've submitted here is how much does cell phone use and social media use, how much does that contribute to anxiety and depression? I think we're going to find out when, after we, we do more studies. I think this is, we're just now kind of seeing some of the results, and it's hard to know what, to what gravity or to what, how are they co correlated? So you probably can't read it, but this book is a book. It's called I, Jean, I Jen. Uh, it's by Jean Twenge, but she yeah. um, she has all the charts <laughs> of all this stuff. And so really they started tracking it. In 2012, over half of the adolescents in the United States, so the majority of teenagers had a smartphone yeah. in their pocket all the time. So really, they started tracking kind of from that point on. A lot of her data was collected in 2016 and 17. And, and um, so it's already changed dramatically. But you were seeing these this increase of social media usage and then and along with that drop offs of um, like getting driver's license. How many of you guys are going to get your driver's license when you're 16? Okay. So that would be 100 percent. Okay, so that means you have to pass the test, though. <laughs> There, everybody's hand would have shot up probably yeah. five, ten years ago. There right. would be no doubt. Now there's a, there's a significant drop, and it's just it really is. Our phones are shaping how we interact with each other a lot, and I think that uh, we're we're meant to connect with each other. So right. I think that there is this feeling of isolation and anxiety that's and disconnectedness that that's that's um, yeah, which is a really weird irony in our world oh, yeah. because I mean the, the, one of the things that we've talked about in here is that there is no generation of human beings in the history of the planet who's had the opportunity at more connection than what we have. I mean, you can be globally connected instantly right here with something that's in your pocket. However, at the same time, that's creating more distance and more isolation. It's and, a genuine and, connection. Yeah, it's less intimacy. Less, right. you know, because you know, teenagers nowadays, and I, again, this isn't telling you guys anything new, it's a lot more difficult for y'all to have face-to-face, eye-to-eye conversations with another human being because you're so used to virtual communication. And I think, uh, you know, just the pressure of trying to sort out what's real and what's not, whether that be through social media or just media in general, is something, again, that is unique to y'all's generation. And, and that is, is um, causing adult anxiety, <laughs> too, yeah. you know. So it's, um, it's, it's quite a challenge that you guys have, for sure. Yeah, and I just want to say a little bit about the fact that it's not just um, the adolescents that are impacted by the social media yeah. 
um, with depression and anxiety. I think across the board, like all of us have been really impacted by being so connected and yet so disconnected. And I think that to there are things that are happening on a very global experience that you know, 50 years ago, there was there was less reporting and there was less understanding about what was going on. And so we as adults still have to work through our fears and anxieties about the even addressing it in the global. First place. Yeah. yeah. And the fact that, um, you know, we are so connected with the the immediate tragedy that can happen yeah. and how some how there are years where we didn't have that that immediate connection where we were feeling it in real time. And I think all of those things are um, stuff that we're just living in a different world. And we have to actively decide how, how, what are our super highways that we're going to pave in our own minds. So. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Um, let me just move on to the next uh, next question here because uh, some of the some of the questions that really came from our students and I'm so proud of you guys for this and this is so reflective of your nature. Yeah, you guys are good. But Those it was just questions. kind of it was it's focused on on others and my friend is dealing with so so some of the questions that we were asked here really kind of distilled into this. Uh, what are some of the obvious signs that someone I know is struggling with the, with depression and what are some signs that may not be quite so obvious? Um, okay, so we were going to start off, oh yeah, sorry, we should have that one up. This, this is kind of going back to what we talked to, like how you kind of feed your brain. Mm. Good quote. Uh, okay, so let's cycle the next one, depression, and then one more. So this you can't read probably, but um, so what we wanted to talk about was the difference between depression and kind of normal ups and downs of, of life, right? So if you see someone sad, that's okay for people to be sad. At what point does it tip over into kind of clinical depression and, and, and something to really get concerned about? Um, so this is, let me explain this to you. So the window of tolerance is like, that's when you're good to go. Like you are regulated, you are okay. Um, the yellow zone is your dysregulation zone. That's when you're feeling uncomfortable, right? Um, and then whenever you get fully dysregulated, you kind of cross over into either hyper arousal, that's fight or flight mode, um, or hypo arousal, which is gonna be freeze, shut down, that, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So this is, you get super upset about something um, and you're not able to kind of regulate yourself, then you can kind of go over the top one direction or another. Now how we regulate ourselves, um, I think is awesome that you guys are asking these questions because your peer support is a great way to regulate yourself, your parents, your church, um, being able to find those support groups so you're not just in this alone um, and, and you're able to kind of bring yourself back into that, that green zone. I think it's also important to know that when someone comes to you dysregulated and they're having a hard time, someone on social media or something happened or whatever, things at home, it, they're going to borrow from your calmness, you're regulated, so that you rationalize for them, hey, it's cool, hey, we're just going to go, you know, blow off some steam, let's hang out together, whatever. It's going to borrow from your calmness, so you're going to feel dysregulated, it's going to feel heavy, it's going to be hard to kind yeah. of manage and cope with those things, and then, um, you know, just to know that that's what is happening, that's why when they feel better walking away and you don't. Maybe you feel worse. Which is precisely what the Apostle Paul was saying in, the, in Galatians chapter 6 when he says, bear each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so it, it's, it's not intended to say, hey, everything's okay with me so I'm not going to be affected if somebody else is down or in dysregulation or whatever. That's gonna take a, it's going to take a toll on you too. Mm -hmm. But so where's we your to, source? We have to decide, did God, yeah. has God called me to? Has God given me the equipment to be able to invest in somebody else's life? Right. Yeah. And then finding your, it can be an outside source also. It could be sports. It can be... Um, Fly fishing. Outdoors, outdoors, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and this is something, I mean, this also changes throughout your life. When you're a, a baby, you know, whenever you're hungry, you cry. And then your mom comes in and, like, calms you down. And... So the older you get, you start to find more and more resources. You rely, you know, less and less on your mom to feed you or wipe your bottom or whatever. Um, 
you, you don't have to, to wail and cry. You, you find all these new and unique ways um, to kind of support yourself and support others. So it changes along the way. How we regulate ourselves and how we help regulate others. Yeah, and the next question that was on here was kind of was very much related to that. Like, if a friend confides in me that he or she is depressed or ask, and ask me not to tell anybody, what should I do? And you know, when do I need to tell an adult what's going on? So, I think let's. You can go to yeah. the next one. Um. Um, so, depression can range from severity. Um, I think the really the heart of what this person is the weight that this person is carrying when they ask this question, and I think all of you kind of feel that too, as we're actually talking, the, the part where it's like, don't tell anyone, comes from like the shame, right? And so there's a lot of kind of um, isolation that depression kind of pulls you into, um, and it gets to be where you, you can't handle it, so you share it with a conf uh, trusted friend. But the thing is, is um, that same weight needs to be addressed by like who can deal with it. Right. If, if, so if depression is mild, they're usually not gonna call it depression. So it's gonna be the severe depression that they're like, I'm really struggling here. And, and that's when the suicidal thoughts can pop up and pop and come in to play. And I think anytime you're dealing with a life or death situation, whether it's like someone's bleeding out, you're gonna call for an adult who has training on that. Same with mental health. If it is suicide is a life or death situation, we just don't know when that's going to happen. That's when you need to confide in an adult. And I think also like the this is over an extended period of, of time here. Um, mm -hmm. So if you have a breakup or something like that or, or a major life event, sure. sadness and some of that stuff is going to be normal. If it starts hanging around or if you start really notice, some of these are really pretty big red flags. Um, if, if you have, um, you know, just a sudden decrease in energy or you're not able to sleep or sleeping too much, you know, there's some pretty big ones here. So feeling sad is, is different than when you start seeing these behavioral, um, you know, situations. Um, another thing like that numbness, another one is like, uh, the term is like anhedonia. So it's like stuff that normally makes you happy, but all of a sudden, I get nothing. It's not making me happy. Imagine like riding a roller coaster with just a total straight face. You, you, so what used to be a source of joy is not there anymore. That's another pretty big sign. Or so a lot of times it's not that numbness. And I think it's okay to say to that person like, um, gosh, I'm really worried about you. Like I, yeah. your life matters to me. What, what happens to you is important. Like, um, I think we need to tell someone about this. I think there is always going to be a little bit of fear of, of that person's anger. And anger comes from an underlying feeling. And that's a fear. Like, what's going to happen next? And I think a lot of times um, depression, and I think um, one of the things is Satan wants to isolate you and keep you from the help you need that you talked about um, over these last couple weeks. But like... Um, Truth does actually make you feel better. And when you finally do tell someone, hey, I'm cutting, mm -hmm. and you can actually get the help that it, and address the underlying thing that's driving you or driving your friend to do that, there's actually true relief yeah. that somebody knows, that somebody cares, and I can actually feel better. Yeah, and, and I'm just telling you, in years of working with teenagers, I've never heard the testimony that says, I was at the end of my rope and things couldn't get any worse, and praise God, nobody did anything about it. You know? So <laughs> when, yeah. when, when you step into a person's life, even if, they, even if they're resistant to it at first, there's going to be that relief that Debbie talked about. And I will say, I'll call out all the guys in the room here, too. This is a, especially, for whatever reason, uh, more difficult for guys, I think if you listen to any, whatever, listen to a country music song or watch any movie, you know, uh, we're all kind of taught to just John Wayne our way through it, just right. tough it out, don't talk about it, don't be a sissy, that kind of thing. And that is not healthy in any way. Um, so we get we get a lot of messages as guys, not that you guys don't as, as women, sure. but I, yeah. I will say, I think that there is a bigger barrier for guys to open up and talk about this and share this stuff. Just do it. 
Um, it doesn't make you weaker in any way to share that you're in pain. In fact, it shows that you're strong enough to get better yeah, um, instead of covering it up with unhealthy. Amen. Uh, speaking of the covering up part, that kind of lead, leads into the next question as well. Uh, what if a person hides their depression behind a smile so effectively that nobody knows or believes how bad you could really be hurting? Um, I kind of put this in there just to be funny because you don't... Um, we'll this, let you know if it's funny or not. <laughs> <laughs> the, that, you know, walking around and my sock is sliding down in the bottom that's of it, your shoe. I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but, like, you just try and, like... It's no big deal, but it really does bother you, right? It bothers me. Socks are a big deal, <laughs> sensory stuff for me. But um, regardless, I think there's an element of just that tough it out, don't whine about it. Um, mm -hmm. You're just trying to get this for attention. Um, it's, it's, you know. Yeah. And I think there is still a message of she just did it because she, you know, um, it was a cry for help and she didn't really mean it. And when in reality... It doesn't matter if you, if you, um, however you get help is important that you're getting the help. And I think it does cause, it does talk, we need to just recognize how brave it does to, um, I'm getting all my words mixed up, but just how brave it, you have to be in order to actually say, I, it always was harder for me to be like, I don't know the answer to this question. Like, you know, I just, I, I'm completely lost. It takes a lot of courage to say, but if you be, you'll be surprised that a lot of people in the room also feel the same way. I don't know what we're talking about either, you know, but it takes that brave first person to say, like, I need help. I and I think if together. we, yeah. if we apply that into our mental health mm -hmm. and we like can feel that too. Yeah. I need help. Just recognize that that takes some bravery. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, with this kind of just briefly circle back to the social media stuff, there is definitely um, a lot of times a facade <laughs> there. There are, you see all the smiles, but. Uh, and filters, you, and yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. If you really get to know a person, all, all of us, no one's life is just a cakewalk. So um, it, it really is, um, you can talk to anybody, whether they're smiling or not, about, you know, how can I help you? You know, put yourself out there. Be, be a resource for them. Yeah. Um, I think also, like, just to recognize that you guys, the weight of, you guys are in the trenches with your friends. And the teachers are there to help, but they, a lot of times they don't know. They're, they have their own things they need to do. Counselors are there to help, but sometimes they're super busy and to actually go out of your way to so in a way I can I feel the fact that like the weight of Catching someone who is suicidal or not suicidal or when to ask for help like that's heavy like if we're talking about um, Someone ha risking, you know possibly not being here tomorrow like that feels really scary and I think as adults I feel that I feel like when, where's that near miss like we almost didn't catch that in time kind of feel and I think um, I think the Holy Spirit can really if you trust in how he's guiding you and if it still fits doesn't settle in you like oh they're fine I think just recognizing that allowing God to lead you that way Stop, take that extra trip by the counselor's office. Like, it may be nothing, but I am kind of concerned about this person. You know, they, they know how to deal with it. But I think erring on the side of caution is always going to be that better choice than, and being wrong than them not being there tomorrow. Yeah, what are, what are they going to say? You know, you, oh, you cared too much? Right. And again, right. that, that's as a Christian, that you would want to, you know, know, it's like, yes, I did. Care too much. <laughs> Guilty as um, charged. Yeah, so I, I think it, it is it is important. To, and we wanted to make sure we kind of dove in a little bit on the suicide and self harm. What are the other questions that we? Uh, well, it, it's really about the experience of counseling. Oh, okay. So, we'll, okay. I think so we this is, uh, I guess, the most um, challenging or scariest bit when you feel overwhelmed if you know if someone is is going to go there or not. Um, so we started with, with uh, um, self-harm. Is it a risk factor for suicide? Self-harm is, um, is pretty prevalent. Um, and, and it is overall, here, this is your slide if you want to talk about it a little more in depth. But it is, it is um, 
the potential yeah. potential Sorry. risk factor for suicide? Um, so, a lot of times, I when I'm talking to people, like there's a threshold that we can tolerate. So stress, 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 and then I've reached my end, and I need immediate relief. And so that's when people use cutting or something like externally to bring their emotions down, to experience how painful they're actually feeling on the inside, on my outside, and stuff like that. And so um, we're seeing more and more of this um, because I think the stress level, we're, not, we're, we're disconnected and to the point where like, then we all of a sudden hit that overload. Um, when you find, when your person, your friend, or when you find yourself being tempted to cut, it's because it's, if you check in with yourself, it's because you're really stressed, and you can relieve, alleviate that stress in other ways. Um, in healthy ways. Healthy right. ways. It, cutting is a sign that something is bigger is going on. It's not a, be, it's not a behavioral issue. It's, not, um, it's, a, it's about trying to alleviate and relieve some of that, and that is only addressed in counseling. You can, it, it just needs, it's so big, it's so complex, um, and if someone is cutting, you don't know, it can very easily lead to suicide. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're suicidal, but it's such a close pathway that um, it Absolutely. only takes that moment to change, your, to change and make it more severe. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the risky part of it is that I get used to and this is not doing it for me and then maybe I don't want to be here anymore. It's time for the... the team to step in, like yeah. not, not handle this on your own. Yeah, um, sure. I'll go to the next one just for, so suicidality is a spectrum. Um, I think we probably, each one of us at some point has had a dark thought and it pops in and it pops out and it, it was a thought. But as we go, this is kind of where we start to get more and more concerned about suicide actually becoming um, this is the ideation spectrum, basically. It starts off as a thought, comes and goes, then it becomes sticks, becomes an idea, becomes a plan, and then the plan is, is kind of acted upon. So this is, again, if you look at that kind of low to high risk, you could talk to your friend about, oh, man, like I had this thought came in and out. But if they're starting to dwell on it or if they're starting to get specific, then, then it's time, time to do something. Um, next one, I think, is... This is warning signs. Um, this is an important one. Um, because it's not just one thing. Right. And I think that's a little bit of what, um, like, when do I need to step in? When do I need to, what are some of the obvious ones? Some of the obvious ones is, like, just talking about it, talking about death, saying, you know, who cares if I'm here tomorrow? This isn't going to matter, whatever. And then there's other things, like, I feel like there's no way out. There's no other option. Those trapped feelings can lead someone down a really, and it's, a, it's just kind of an indicator of how um, cornered and uh, how dark their thoughts can get. And guys, I'll let you know too that uh, with, <laughs> with Travis and Debbie's permission, I think we, we're gonna make these slides available. Okay, perfect. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, so a lot of these things that uh, they've said, hey, this is important, focus in on that. I know they kind of come on and off the screen, but we'll make them available to you right. and to your parents. And the, the next one, I know we're kind of, maybe transitioning on, but the, the next one, um, th this is just an example of how you never know what's kind of lies beneath, yeah. but if you go to the next slide, this is a really good one. You're probably not going to be able to read, but is a really, this is a great one for you that makes a great handout. Mm -hmm. um, take it seriously, ask questions, and get help, and, and that has a list of the warning signs on that other side, too. So um, That's a really good one. That's from the Grant Halliburton Foundation, which is an organization in Dallas that's, they're really... Um, they're an awesome group, so and based on around suicide prevention. Um, while we're on this subject, um, I'm looking right now for the suicide hotline number. I think it's important for all teenagers to have them in their phone so that you can text it to your friend or you can text it yourself. Or, um, uh, but the National Suicide Prevention um, Lifeline number. Um, this is a time where you can get your phones out if you have it. <laughs> um, is 800-273-8255. And I think, um, I think it's important um, to just, even if you don't have a counselor right there with you, even, you know, you can access someone who can talk you off a ledge or can listen to you or can listen to your friend 
and get you the help they need. And if they feel like they can't, then they can access um, 911 and stuff like that. Guys, in interest of our time here tonight, well, sure. um, I want to kind of uh, pull together these last couple of questions because these last couple of questions are about the counseling experience. Now, th there's many of us in the room that we've had that experience before and many of us in the room, for, that's a totally foreign and maybe a scary or taboo thing to think about. So really some of these questions are about uh, what's it like to go to a counselor? Or do, do I sit there? On a, do I lay there on a couch with a guy with a clipboard? Uh, just, uh, you know, how long do I have to visit a counselor before things start having to work? And then even a personal experience is I already go to a Christian counselor, but sometimes I wonder if it's working, uh, you know, is this really pointing anywhere? So if you can just talk with us about what we could, what we can expect with the counseling experience. And I would even kind of add to that too. Um, what is the distinction between a counselor and a Christian counselor? So anyway, have those. Um, so first kind of thought is what is it like? And I think um, it's important to know that not, you're not going to click with every counselor, just like friends are different and teachers are different. Like, you're, there's, there could be a personality thing. And so I always tell people, give it four sessions. And in four sessions, you feel like this is working and you can talk to me about anything. But if, if in four sessions you don't and you feel like you're filtering and you're not really getting it and you don't feel like I'm getting it, then we can find an, we'll find you another, I'll give you referrals and stuff. Because it's not always going to be that immediate. Um, I do sometimes take notes because I feel like that helps me track and pay attention. Um, but then sometimes I don't, and I'm just, you know, it's just kind of talking things out. Yeah, and the notes are, they're not like judgment of like, oh, this kid's crazy. It's like, this is, it's <laughs> uh -oh, like. Oh, he started writing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it, it, it is. It's notes for us to remember. This is a really important thing that they said. It's, it's not judgment. Um, and I think uh, to, it's kind of speaking to that, that is in no way a role as a counselor. In fact, it, it's emphatically, it is unethical for someone to be judging you or telling you this is right and this is wrong in the session. We're not there to lecture. This, the, the process of counseling is 100% y'all's. Um, so it is not um, do this, do that. If, if that's what it is at any point, like if I'm just another old guy telling you what to do, you will bail. You'll walk on whatever progress that, that you made. The, the intent of the process is for you to tell yourself and explore and find these things on yourself. And that's really our job, is to show, show you different parts of yourself and help you understand yourself a little bit better, what you need, identify uh, coping skills. So um, I, I think that's really important. I think that a lot of people think, especially young people think, I'm going to go in there, they're going to throw a bunch of medicine at me and tell yeah. me that I'm all messed up. Right. But um, that, that's not, that's what psychiatrists do. <laughs> no, no. It's true. There, there are different, and that's their specialty, and it's far less talking. It's more about just kind of going to your medical doctor, too. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to talk a little bit about was, like, um, which I lost. Oh, for as long as you're kind of experiencing whatever it is, whether it's depression or anxiety or PTSD or whatever, however long that is, like let's say it's a year long, you probably need to take two to three months to process that year long. If it's been six years that you've struggled with this thing, then it's going to be a long time that you're in therapy. And there, it's not a immediate trajectory, just like the rest of our lives, so not immediate like from start to finish. You're going to take the, the windy path because that's how our bodies process and what makes sense one day doesn't make sense another. And, and we're just figuring it out. And so I want to encourage whoever kind of feeling like stuck, like that is also part of the process. And I think just exploring, I feel stuck and, and moved. And, and there's some things that you can do to support that. Yeah, and in no way is it a sign of being broken. It could be feeling stuck or it could, it could be, hey, I mean, there's a, I, I've had people come and we're doing sessions about like, I really want to, to achieve this, this, and this. It's more of almost like a goal setting thing, how they're gonna better themselves mm -hmm. instead of struggle sessions, you know? So really anyone could go to counseling. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you. Right. It, it's of use to, to anybody in this room. Um, I think the confidentiality is important. Mm -hmm. With uh, Anytime I'm dealing with someone who's a, who's a minor, so 17 and under, your parents have access to your chart, but we talk ahead of time and we say, okay, here's the thing. 
it's the most important thing is for us to have trust. And so when do I need to come and talk to you about something? And so it's about suicide, it's about homicide. Um, cutting is a gray area that I, I think we talk about ahead of time and we make sure, but if there are, if it, it's a safety issue, that's when we, um, we talk to the parents. I think you had a good example of how that conversation yeah. typically so goes. So sometimes, and, and I would say even with like, um, if there is any risky behavior, like significant drug or alcohol use too, where it, it's getting to the point, or if it's a drug that's dangerous, dangerous, like um, it's something that what I'll do is I'll say, okay, by Friday, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk with your parents about this. So you, yeah. have, you have a week to do this. This needs to be, again, it's not our role to advocate and get in your family and, and, and get you in trouble or, or fix this. This is your decision. At this point, um, you need to talk to your parents about this. It's better coming from you. Yeah, and it's okay. It'll be safe. If you don't, I'm concerned, and I, I'm going to talk with you about it. So for those really gray area stuff, like self-harm and stuff like that, I, I, I give the clients every opportunity to, to advocate for themselves and say, hey, I need help to, to their parents um, before I ever do it for them. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, and I, and I do think that, I know we're on time, but um, um, this is our approach. And not every counselor right. is perfect in the way they respond to things. And I think if you say, because this happened because of this one counselor, and you rule counseling out completely, then you are dis you're disservicing yourself um, from getting support. We're all humans, and it is, the gray area is really hard to walk sometimes. So not sometimes there's not a very clear best solution. So right, and and, and one of the things that I would urge as well is that. Um, you know, we, when we're talking about that distinction between uh, a counselor and a Christian counselor, I mean, it's, it's a whole lot like any of your other relationships. There's people who can claim that they're followers of Jesus and they're not genuinely followers of Jesus. That's there, there's no exemption in this in this uh, this wow. walk of life either. Uh, and so it's it's important to, that you and that your parents are able to use discernment. Hopefully, you're able to use resources like our church, and there's other resources that, that we can make available to you through your church, through our church that will hopefully uh, cut off some of those bad experiences, but it's impossible to cut off all of the, the bad experiences as well. Uh, guys, in interest of, of time here, I just want to, uh, now, uh, Travis and Debbie, whether or not they know it, they've agreed to uh, hang out and talk with any of you <laughs> afterward. Uh, but is, is there anything, any final thing that as we're gathered here together as a group, is there any final thing that you guys uh, would would leave us with while we're here together as a group before we dismiss for tonight? No, I think again, thank you guys for for bringing this up. Thank you for for making this accessible to um, to you guys. And yeah, take care of each other. You bet. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Well, guys, I want you guys to y'all y'all thank Travis and Debbie so much for their time and their talent that they've dedicated to us here tonight. And again, both of them are going to be hanging around, uh, hanging around afterwards right over here in Common Grounds. We've got some snacks and some goodies available for, for all of us as well. Uh, so as we go over there, you can, you can come up to them and ask for a little more clarity on uh, something that we've already talked about tonight. Or maybe a question that you didn't send in before or something that came to your mind here tonight. Go ahead and feel free to ask them. But man, just like what we talked about through this entire thing is that the experiences that you have in your life... God cares about you more than anything. He has the very hairs on your head numbered, which means he's very good at subtraction for some of us, right? But God cares about every intricate part of your life. So the things that are going on that cause you anxiety, that flare up your anxiety, that deepen your depression, those are very near and dear to the heart of God. So don't walk into the doors of a church and act like it doesn't exist. I got to put on the happy face and that everything's cool face. We are allowed to hurt because this is a place where we're supposed to heal. Let's pray together. We will be dismissed tonight. God, we thank you so much uh, for the power of your word. We thank you for the presence of you, Holy Spirit. Uh, God, we thank you so much for the calling that you've placed, particularly on these two who have uh, sat before us tonight and, and shared with us of their experiences, their education, 
uh, the calling and ministry that you've given them. God, we pray that you would bless Travis in his practice and the, the ministry that you've called him to there. Uh, God, we pray that you would continue to bless Debbie as well in the ministry that you've called her to, the unique ways in which she's able to uh, impact the lives of people uh, through the gifting that, and the experience that you've given her. God, for all of us, as we continue to walk through life, fighting this battle with anxiety and depression, God, we praise you for the truth that we can get from your precious life-giving word, that the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. So God, we trust you, we praise you, and we lift these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.